Okay, folks, we're going to start uh, the second session in a minute, ex in exactly a minute, minute and a half. But meanwhile, I thought I'll share with you the fact that we have had fabulous discussion this morning. And uh, there's going to be a part two to some of the housing and stuff issues that we're doing, which is the bricks and sticks, uh, which is being done, by the way, on uh, uh, 28th of January. It's on our website. And you, you go to our homepage, biztech.org. And of course, on 25th, we're doing on the privacy, the pragmatic approach that the head of KPMG, uh, Sylvia Kingsmill, is doing. So I guess we have another minute to go. And I'll just make sure that all that is intact here so that bear with me as I make. All right, uh, Tariq, if you are there, unmute yourself and turn your camera on, please. Perfect. So, so we are now, our topic now that we are going to, to discuss, uh, in fact, Tariq is going to present, is about digital micro learning. And he got a pretty impressive background and uh, I will let him <laughs> describe himself uh, in all the details. In case um, there should be no confusion, he his last name is same as mine. That's because he's my son. So, Tariq, I'm going to get out of the camera and let you talk about give you a little background and then take it away. And you can, should be able to share slides as well. Um, I will. Th thank you. Um, and it is precisely because I'm your son that I know that you're a tough act to follow when it comes to presentations. But uh, I will try my best, um, and I'm going to start by uh, sharing that I talked a little bit about the topic today, which is uh, really around, at its core, the skills gap. Uh, I won't belabor the point with statistics, because I suspect that most people here um, uh, will be familiar with the idea that, um, that, uh, you know, that there is a, a giant gap in skills that is being created um, that has been created over a long time in, in the workplace, and that is um, only getting worse because of the pandemic. And you know, sometimes, sometimes the, uh, the way I think about it, the simplest way I think about it, is that the average person lives, you know, probably around 80 years. And um, in the last 25 years, we have seen um, uh, a shift um, towards technology-based models and how that has disrupted uh, industries outside of technology from you know, hotels and taxis, and everything else at a level that um, has exceeded the ability of the workforce to adapt. Uh, again, if you have people who live 80 years and the traditional model is that they get educated for a portion of time, they finish that education and then they work in a job and maybe for their career or only a few places in their career in sort of one general area, then it, it tends to be quite hard if the economy moves so quickly that you have people of middle age and other ages, um, and frankly, youth who are who are just sort of um, finding themselves victim to a skills gap where uh, there are openings that there's, there's just not an alignment of the skills that um, that are being produced by our educational systems, and um, and what we are um, seeing. I'm having. Uh, in the meantime, I'll just sort of introduce the topic. I think one of the the, the major things that we we um, have been thinking about at Rumi, which I'll talk about in a second, is that our focus is on digital education. Um, we were created about seven years ago with the goal of being able to, I'd say leapfrog access to learning in, in, um, in underserved communities. The background and history of that is sort of linked to work I'd done earlier, in my career to bring um, basic mobile phones into emerging markets and underserved communities around the world. The idea there was that they didn't have landlines and so they were able to leapfrog to a cheaper, faster and better uh, mechanism um, uh, of just, did, of, of just you know, so wireless communications. Uh, and what has been happening in the last number of years is that um, similar things have been happening with learning. Um, and it is the most powerful for underserved communities because, I mean, it works for everybody, but it's really the most powerful for underserved communities because those are the precisely the ones for whom they um, you know, did not have uh, good access earlier and uh, where they're now sort of able to receive the latest because they have a digital connection. And in some form, I think people understand intuitively that um, 
that um, you know that uh, that you know you can learn everything you want online um, just because you know frankly I think most people on this will remember that uh, a time when um, um, when uh, there was um, you know it was very difficult to uh, receive access to any kind of basic knowledge in the last 20 years you've seen that shift um, as um, you know, Wikipedia has become available for free online and a host of other applications. So let me kick off this presentation. I'm gonna start from the beginning. Um, uh, I just set it up with unfortunately a few technical glitches and a bit of context around uh, the workforce skills gap. Now I'm gonna switch it and try to make this presentation engaging by talking about a separate problem. And I'm gonna connect it to in a second, you'll see how. That second problem, again, unrelated to anything you've probably talked about today, um, and unrelated to the skills gap is the challenge of social media. Again, bear with me. We'll, I'll show you where we're going in a second. Most people here on this call and most people in society have now picked up to the fact that social media is frankly a lot more destructive to society than we previously believed or really understood because it was so new. Uh, obviously the most prevalent would be sort of political strife and, and um, instability and, and, and all that created by and division created by social media. Another aspect that has gotten a lot of attention recently is, is a challenge to mental health, particularly for young communities. And you've seen there's data showing that for young teenage girls, for example, suicide rates are triple you know, the average, uh, and a whole bunch of other sort of um, scary data points that people have uh, related back to social media. And some of you may have seen recently a documentary on Netflix called The Social Dilemma that um, is doing the rounds and that talks a lot about this. And one of the most fascinating things about it is that people sort of look at that and they think, well, how is it possible that it's doing so much damage um, if, you know, the average session for, let's say, Instagram is so short, right? Six and a half minutes, you know, the average person grabs their mobile phone, they just browse for a minute and they put it down. And the reason it's so damaging is because that aggregates into a significant amount of time per day. Um, the social media companies make each session micro. Um, quick, easy, just something when you're, it's fun and easy when you're bored, you get a dopamine rush. And the reason for that is that they know very well that um, people have switched to using mobile technology. And if you use your mobile phone as your primary, you know, device of choice for hours a day, um, then they need to understand exactly how to hack, hack your attention on that. And they, and they make rewarding experiences for quick mobile sessions. And they're so good at it that add, that adds up to a lot of time per day. And when we looked at this challenge, we had been doing work in the education space, in the learning space, um, really in this with a focus on job skills and career skills, but ultimately it's education, it's learning. And we were looking at the latest technology models to see how can we rapidly close the skills gap, right? How can we find a way that um, we have a workforce and people who are digitally connected and we can bring them skills that can be disseminated so easily using technology today uh, in a way that hasn't been happening. And one of the most fascinating things that we learned about the learning and education space in general is that it is focused primarily on quality. That kind of makes sense. If you're in a learning program, the quality of that learning program is obviously gonna be directly correlated to you know, the impact that's created in the sense of what did you learn and what skills did you pick up? And what we started realizing was that as things have become digital in the last 10 or 20 years, um, you don't just need quality, you need engagement. And the education technology space, as it's called, um, is really a merger of those two. The education sp space focuses on quality because it focused on that for hundreds of years. The technology space is focused heavily on engagement. So what do I mean by engagement? Let's take an example. Um, you have a one hour lecture. It doesn't have to be a class session. It could be um, you know, a, a, something on building skills that companies put out all the time these days and they put on their website. And it's some kind of a one or two hour session or webinar. Um, in the old days, when you ran that session in person, you don't have to worry about engagement because you have a captive audience. So your audience is sitting there in a lecture hall, let's say, or, or in, a, in a room. And if seven minutes into your one hour lecture, people realize that it's kind of boring and it sucks and they don't want to be there, they really can't leave because there's social pressure, they've maybe paid to go on you. Know, there's a whole bunch of things that have created an environment where they're captive and they have few other options. And so they don't tend to leave in the middle of it. Um, that is vastly different when you do the exact same thing with technology. So imagine you open a YouTube video. Um, 
the first thing everybody does, they look at the total length of the time on the video. And if it's longer than a few minutes, the data shows that the vast majority of people close it. Similarly, uh, if you load a one, a one hour lecture about some very, very high, uh, high quality lecture, it's a great learning lecture, and you start watching it on your phone and seven minutes into that lecture, you get bored. It's not at all like a classroom where you, you're stuck there in your captive audience. You just put your phone down and you close it. Or what the data shows most people do is that they switch to something more engaging. That happens across the board for young people. It happens to everybody across the board. It happens most to young people because they're most digitally savvy and most sort of engaged by social media. In most of those cases, when they close the meaningful lecture or learning content, they open uh, something in social media. And um, you know, the reason it's so important to understand that is that in the last nearly year since the lockdowns have occurred, we've seen a natural experiment of that occurring in the learning space where provinces in Canada or states in the US have made available as quickly as they could learning materials online that are aligned to their curriculum. And in some sense, you know, there was a lot of people said, okay, this, this is great, this works, everybody has everything. Obviously it doesn't work very well because again, if you have a textbook and it becomes you know, a PDF and now it's given to someone on their phone, I can guarantee you that there's no 17 year old who we wanna teach skills to or 22 year old who is going to sit around and read a PDF on, on their phone when the alternative is a TikTok video. I can tell you myself, I'm in my 40s, I wouldn't do that. Uh, and so the really, really important thing about, about learning programs when they become digital, and this is the learning space hasn't really figured out with technology space and social media companies understand inside out, is that you need engagement. You need to package it in a way that people actually consume it, otherwise you will absolutely teach them nothing and they'll learn very little. Uh, and that has led to us taking a bit of a different approach in what we're doing, where we look at what people need. We know what they need. They need job skills that are, and, and, and career skills that help them close the gap and understand how to get better, get a job, how to understand even soft skills, leadership and other things that help them enter the workforce at the time, at a time there's a big gap and what's needed and what and what's there. And we also want to overlap that with what people want. What people want, again, we know the data. You could look at how people use their phones and see how they gravitate towards social media platforms that again have really zeroed on on the engagement piece. Uh, in and so really what we're trying to do is drive that into two and say that well we want to find that overlap where you know we can give you something you want but it's also something that you need. And the way we've done that is really through micro learning. The idea here has been that we've been operating for years in a bunch of countries but we evolved our model towards micro learning because in all cases we tend to deliver to communities um, across the board who use mobile devices as their computer of choice. As a side note, you know, mobile devices are the computer of choice for young and lower income people globally in general, but it's growing across the population. And our idea was, why don't we start to build a model around micro learning where people can learn in short five to seven minute snippets on a mobile first approach which a um, recent, re recent research shows has an over 20% improvement in learning retention. And then secondly, also uh, allows people to learn more um, uh, because they, it's, it's, it's parceled out in a format they can use more. I'll zip through the last, uh, th these bits really quickly. The, the, the model we've built uh, is a little bit like Wikipedia. It is um, using, um, uh, author, the, or using, expert authors to create bytes that are all an open and um, free learning platform that anyone, anyone can use. Again, a byte is just a micro learning course. It takes, you know, five, seven minutes. And where we create those bytes today is from, first of all, a volunteer community that uh, is growing. Again, it's very much like Wikipedia uh, and they create excellent content. And uh, the difference being Wikipedia, we vet it before it goes up. The second is celebrity experts. So Chris Hatfield just created a byte. There's a number of others that are creating them Kind of, you kind of think of it like a master class, but it, it's you know open and free um, for anyone to use. And then finally, corporate volunteers. This is the biggest and most uh, sort of grow, biggest growing area for us is that we've actually built an entire model and platform that using purely virtual volunteering, um, corporate employees can create um, uh, content that is aligned to their skills and expertise. Uh, and since we launched this, um, just after the pandemic began, uh, employees from Amazon, uh, Manulife, the Carlisle Group, um, you know, Air Miles, a whole bunch of companies across the board have all taken part in virtual volunteering and have created content that you could see today on the, on the platform on Rumi Learn at Rumi.org. The idea being, again, we want to find the best expertise possible 
and have people creating content that is then delivered to underserved communities and sort of facilitate the knowledge transfer that we need, but through a very, very simple, you know, open, free, low friction, micro learning approach that again, makes it really learner centric because instead of giving something that we think is perfect and that, you know, is developed in a, in a lab somewhere, we we're, we're basing it on what people actually consume and use. Um, you know, today, the way we do it is we, we're in closer to learners by working with partners across the board. Um, uh, and I won't go through these, but um, I would sort of uh, focus on ones like, you know, Roshan, for example, which is the largest telco in Afghanistan, um, which is actually running a program now to make access to bytes uh, entirely free of data charges for, um, for across the country. But it began with programs we started doing years ago for girls and women's education in the country. Again, the model of digital delivery in places like that is far superior to the you know the existing methods which don't exist. Um, so a little background on Roomie since I didn't do that at the beginning, but I like to kind of do a little bit later on. Um, we're, our, our technology since we began in 2013 is in over 30 countries. Um, it's being used significantly now in Canada for uh, uh, for remote indigenous communities because the technology has features where it works offline and other things that are really tailored to, to bring it to underserved communities. Um, it's the subject of a Harvard Business School case study that they started teaching in, uh, in there and else, elsewhere in 2017. Um, and, uh, and this actually, I'll, I'll be a little bit on the human experience, you know, th this is also being led globally by partners that we work with. And that this in the picture there is Pashtana Durrani, who runs Learn Afghanistan, is a, a pioneer, much like Malala Yousafzai was in bringing um, uh, education to, to, to girls and women in the country. And again, using technology has turned out to be far superior because you can get around all kinds of boundaries that existed, both infrastructure, culture, and otherwise. Um, and uh, and now a lot more programs that we're starting to do in North America. The top right is a, pro is a picture from Wood Green Community Services that for uh, those of you who are based in, in Toronto or somewhere in Ontario would, would probably know. And the programs are using digital learning for recent newcomers. Um, and that is literally across the board. I mean, there was a, a lady in one of the programs who was in her 80s who had immigrated from Hong Kong and was using um, our technology to learn, you know, to, to improve her English. And so in a sense, we do focus on, um, on younger people because it's the greatest need and we know we can reach them best through technology, but um, the skills gap exists across all sorts of areas and across all age levels. And what we're seeing now is that it is growing kind of across the board. Um, so a few a few quick examples of bytes I would just tell you you can go and check them out at roomy.org. Um, again, it's all open and free, but there are often things that are very topical. So that's why living when remotes, there's uh, bytes on the COVID-19 app as an example to spread awareness uh, and other things. And and they're often hard skills like um, the difference between continuous and um, discrete uh, data, or you know the difference between data and information, and the specific bytes on all of those, often created by by again employees at Amazon or other places where they tend to you know focus on their job expertise, as well as other ones that are very much focused on soft skills that again tend to get under underappreciated uh, for their importance. And these are all easily shareable through WhatsApp and other platforms. And so, I would finish by saying. You know, the, the point of this presentation, I think, is not really about Rumi per se. It's about talking about, number one, the fact that there's a giant skills gap. We all know that that exists. Uh, we knew it existed a couple of years ago, and that is getting much worse because right now you have uh, a pandemic where it's just accelerating certain trends, um, many leaning towards technology and, and other sorts of things. But that exacerbates the skills gap because it's decimating certain industries where there will be lots of unemployed people who lack the skills to adjust to where the economy is going. At the same time, you also have a, a window of opportunity because at the same time, the other negative thing that's happening in the pandemic is that people are using social media more. Um, and we know that that has an aggregate negative effect on society, both political, mental health, and otherwise. And our goal at the end of the day is to build something that anyone can uh, uh, can sort of take part in. Again, we're open and free and we're, not, we're a registered charity in the US and Canada. Uh, and so it's not something that we're selling to you. We're actually saying the opposite. We're saying, listen, there's an opportunity here to take two things that are negative, that have both been exacerbated by the pandemic and merge them so that people get a dopamine rush doing something that is actually socially useful, both to them individually and in the aggregate. And in doing that can sort of start to you know, improve mental health and, and political cohesion at the same time as we're uh, also closing the skills gap. So 
that's my presentation. I apologize. It was got a little bit shorter. I, I zoomed through a few parts because of the technical glitches, but um, that was all on my side. Uh, I hadn't set it up correctly. So sorry about that. Well, Tarek, that was uh, very good. You can stop sharing the screen so that I can pick it back from there. That was very good. And I think, as you mentioned, people can get... Tarek, uh, yeah, perfect. Uh, people can get involved with uh, Rumi as uh, uh, Tarek talked about. In fact, we copy some of the small bites uh, that Rumi does. We, we at Bistec are copying. In fact, we've got a 